So the others are um, Barbara and Karishma, and they can introduce themselves when they get up here. Uh, pleasure to be here. Sorry that we're a little bit late. Uh, um, I'm sure this surprises you, but there's a lot of traffic in Dhaka. <laughs> so um, this um, presentation is going to be really informal. Uh, that's the way we like it. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, don't wait for the end. Uh, stop me in the middle and, and ask a question. Um, the goal, I guess, of the, of the talk, as it was explained to me by IFTI, was to just kind of share what we've done here in Bangladesh over the last five years, some of the work that we've done in the past, uh, some of the work that we plan to do in the future. And it's my understanding that this room represents a group of people that want to uh, potentially pursue a career in renewable energy. Is that correct? Not no. only that, mixed now. What? It's mixed. Not mixed from from it's already mixed. Mixed. Right, right, right. So some of you maybe have already pursued a career, a career and others are looking to. And, and so uh, beyond the work that we are doing, um, we'd love to entertain any questions you, that you have about renewable energy careers, uh, uh, any topic that uh, falls underneath renewable energy, I think we probably can, can handle. So look forward to uh, an open uh, dialogue. Um, So, this particular, make sure I don't fall off the stage. Uh, this particular um, uh, slide is kind of an intro to the work that we started in 2013. And in this slide deck, I, I really stole it from the presentation that our team made back in May of 2018. So you see, I didn't change the date. But it was a, a, a presentation we made uh, last May right here in Dhaka. And it was a project overview, um, looking through the, the reason why we, we started the project, the scope of the project, the results of the project, and, and then we entertained questions along the way. So I'm just going to um, move forward with uh, that presentation. Um, so, uh, oh, and by the way, too, <coughs> the, um, uh, I'm going to skip through a number of these slides. and and provide FD a copy of this presentation. So uh, if you see me uh, skipping through a slide, if it's one that you really had a question about, tell me to go back and we'll, we'll chat about it. Um, but know that you'll get a copy of these slides if you want and you can use it as a reference. So that's another reason why I'll probably skip through some of these slides so there's more, question, more time for a Q&A. Um, so why did we come here in the first place back in 2018? Um, same reason we, we uh, work with a number of countries. There were some energy challenges here. Uh, there was a master plan that came out in 2010. I know there's been a refreshed master plan in 2016. And you're looking to control energy costs, uh, diversify your fuel mix, um, hopefully uh, install some clean uh, energy. And, and from our perspective, um, we think it, it, it can go beyond the, the clean reasons to install renewable energy. I think it just makes financial sense. You, you have no cost for fuel, and you can look over a 20-year horizon, which is the typical length of a, of a power purchase agreement, and, um, and you fixed your, your costs over that 20-year period of time. And if you compare a 20-year um, wind PPA with gas or coal or or even nuclear, that it usually wins because there's this there's too much fluctuation and volatility in the fuel price for other technologies. But with wind, again, free fuel, you know exactly what your uh, equipment costs are, and you amortize that over time, and you've got you've got a predictable cost uh, over a 20-year period. So we think it makes good financial sense. Um, I want to jump past that one here. So. <laughs> I know that um, um, as I've been working in Bangladesh, they've, you've talked a lot about um, a, a vision for a, a goal, um, a vision or a goal for renewable energy, and 10% um, uh, is, that, is that current goal. I think it's 10% by 2021. And um, 
I think that might be hard to get that number at this point in time, but you know, that's a, that's a challenge that I think exists in, in every country. It certainly started that way in the United States. Uh, they put a vision out there for increasing renewables and then actually um, have a goal and, uh, and they missed that goal uh, right at the very beginning. And now uh, that we've got those first few projects in the, under the ground uh, 20 years ago, uh, we've got a mature industry and now the goals that are being set are being uh, met and, and exceeded. Um, so when, when looking at project development um, and, and starting a new industry, you're really, I, you know, this is kind of a key, a key slide, you're really trying to see um, uh, and identify what all the, the risks are associated with a, a particular project. And uh, NREL came, came to, with USAID funding, uh, came to Bangladesh to try to attack one of those particular risks. It's a, it's a risk that we um, spend a lot of time on in dozens of countries, and that is uh, de-risking the, the wind resource. In some cases, it might, if we're looking at a solar, um, solar uh, um, industry, we might be putting up irradiance devices. In this particular case, we're, we're putting up MET towers and developing a computer model and taking that, that um, raw data from the MET towers, informing the computer model and developing a database that we think would provide information that de-risks uh, the, that wind resource. Certainly, that's one of many. As, I, as you see, I've outlined um, six or seven of them there. I'm not gonna go into each one, but the key for this first uh, phase of work was to focus on understanding the wind resource risk. You're not gonna eliminate it, but you're gonna understand it. And from that, we think that uh, that's one of the first steps for being able to project finance uh, wind projects. Um, let me jump past that. So I put this slide together with um, stealing from, from other people's slides and adding maybe a couple of my own. Um, and I think this is maybe one worth, worth going through possibly every bullet because we've been here for, for um, about three days now. This is the third trip that I've made. Um, and as we meet with more and more people, um, we continue to hear this age-old um, um, this age-old uh, comment that um, there is no wind in Bangladesh. There are no wind opportunities. And that was one of the reasons why we came here in 2013. And uh, and there were there are other myths that we we've heard. Hopefully we've we've de mystified the, the no wind resource uh, comment because our results show that there, there is a wind resource here and, and there is potential. Um, but why, why did that myth exist in the first place? Well, we certainly have heard it in, in other parts of, of the United States and we've heard it in other countries. And, and here's a, a few of the, the reasons why uh, those first few projects didn't work. Uh, while there, why there was uh, failure. One was the data that was maybe collected uh, here in Bangladesh, and again, this is a problem that we've had in our country as well, uh, was collected at too low of a level. It was, at, it was data collected at 20 or 30 meters off the ground when the hub heights now of, of wind turbines are 80, 110, and actually they're pushing to 120 meters off the ground right now. So certainly you, you, can, you can calculate wind shear, which is basically a, a calculation that allows you to estimate, if you know what the wind resource is at, at one level, or actually a couple different levels on a met mass, you can extrapolate to a, a height that's above that, that measured data. Um, but if you're at 20, 30 meters off the ground, and that's the, length, that's the height of your met mass, you've got a big error rate in trying to estimate what the wind uh, speed is at 120 meters. It's just, it's, it's so strong that I'd say that that data from 20 to 30 meters is, is uh, irrelevant. It's, it's worthless. Um, so, so that's one of the, the problem, or that's one of the problems that we tackled here on, on this task was to measure the wind speed at 80 meters uh, off the ground and at 60 and 40 and 20 and from those measurements for these tall towers, we are able to extrapolate 
uh, more accurately, and again, couple it with the model that we had that was using satellite data, coupling it with SODAR data that's looking 200 meters off the ground, and we think that we have a, a better sense of what that wind resource is. Um, the old models that were used, the old computer models, were also uh, 10 to 15 years old, and we're using the, the latest models. Um, here's one, uh, one reason that I think uh, causes a number of projects to fail, and that is you, you're, you're working with a wind developer that only has access to one particular turbine because he found a, a, a good deal on the street, and, and, and it happens to be a class one turbine. What does class one, class two, class three mean? Class one is for really strong winds, wind speeds that are maybe over eight, nine, um, even 10 meters per second. That's not gonna work well um, at a, uh, with a wind resource that maybe is, is five, six meters per second. So you need to match your wind turbine with the wind resource. Um, and when you do that, you'll get uh, more production and, and that can lead to a successful project. Um, here's one that I hear of a, a lot of times with utilities that uh, uh, have old, I used to work for a utility, so I'm not, I'm not poking fun at, um, at people I don't know that aren't friends of mine, um, but some of the old utility engineers that, that maybe focused on coal and gas and didn't, um, was, they weren't interested in, in bringing in a new technology, um, or maybe there were some financial uh, incentives for that utility to keep moving forward with gas and coal. We'll uh, sometimes uh, um, use the media, the, the newspaper, to say, hey, the wind uh, PPA that I got has a price that uh, is more expensive than what I'm paying for, for gas and coal right now. I'll hear, that, I'll hear that frequently. But what they end up doing, it's not apples to apples comparison. What they end up doing is comparing a one year snapshot. Here's the cost or the price of, of wind in year one, and they're comparing it um, to the cost of, or in price of, of coal or gas, wherever that latest contract was, also in year one. But if the, if the power purchase agreement is for 20 years, Shouldn't you be comparing the average cost over the 20 years for wind versus the average cost of wind over um, for coal or gas? Shouldn't it be a 20-year comparison compared to a 20-year comparison, not just year one? And that's, and of course the answer is yes, it should be, but they don't do that. Sometimes you'll see that very first year look more expensive, but if you look over the lifetime of the wind contract and compare that to the same uh, life costs of wind or coal, excuse me, coal or gas, uh, wind almost always wins. Um, I chatted a little bit about the, the fact that MET measurements should be, and MET stands for the short name that we use in the business for meteorological, um, it can be a meteorological station, which means it could be a, uh, a tall uh, MET tower using anemometers to collect uh, the wind, or a MET station that also could use the technology of a sonar and, um, and, and actually beam a, a sonar uh, beam up into the, the sky and measure wind speed and temperature and direction that way as well. Uh, both kind of are, are technologies that are proven. Uh, LIDAR is another one, a third one that's used for um, uh, measuring wind speeds and temperature and, and uh, direction. Uh, again, got to mat, kind of got to match the the um, height of the measurement closer to what the hub height of the turbine is. And that's a mistake that's made often. Um, I already covered number two. Um, number three, another reason why projects fail, I think, in in nascent industries, and that's. Um, because they don't use a, a, an experienced developer or an experienced manufacturer. Either one of those can provide problems. So if you jump right out into, your, into the industry, or excuse me, you jump right out with a, your first project um, and you use a uh, turbine that uh, maybe is kind of new, um, 
maybe there's only uh, one project that's been built using that turbine, they're still trying to figure out the bugs, or you work with a developer that hasn't been able to uh, finance a project ever before, and you, but they're the first ones that come into town and they build a project, those projects typically fail. So you wanna make sure when you're, when you're starting with your industry, new industry, creating a new industry, that you're using an experienced um, owner-operator and you're using an experienced uh, manufacturer. This is an example I, I like to use um, frequently. It's a real life example of um, a state that I'm actually from. I'm from uh, Indiana and up in the northwest corner there is kind of where I grew up, the very far northwest uh, corner. This is Lake Michigan and this is Chicago just to orient you a little bit. And um, in 2004 on that left hand side is a, is a wind map that was created and it was using a 50 meter tower. And uh, nobody came into the state of Indiana and, and wanted to develop a project because the wind speeds look low. Um, does that sound familiar? So then they did uh, improve the wind map in, uh, in another, well I guess it was a couple years later and in the, in, in, at the end of uh, I think 2006, they performed a tall tower study where they were looking at um, MET towers and they installed some anemometry on, um, uh, I think it was seven, seven or eight, uh, met, excuse me, um, communication towers uh, around the state of Indiana and created a new map and that's the map on the right and you can see that things, that things uh, popped. And right here is one of those pops. This is Benton County, just north of Purdue University. For those of you that are familiar with Purdue, that's where it's located. And 1,500 megawatts got built just because of that map, I think. Uh, primarily because it, it showed people that there was a wind resource and that was, um, that was a result of, again, measuring the data closer to what the hub height was because those those towers that they uh, were using were 90 and 100 meters tall. I talked about this already, so I'm gonna jump past it, but this is basically, again, it'll be a reference point for you. You gotta match your, your um, turbine class to the, the wind resource. So this brings us to, to today, or, or brings us to Bangladesh. Uh, these are the, uh, the picture on the left I kinda like, because I took it. Um, but it was when we went out uh, in 2013 and um, looked at uh, um, the entire country and tried to identify where there were good sites for, for MET towers. And I think this was taken around Rangpur. And um, we located nine locations and um, put up MET towers. Most of them, there are actually seven towers. You can look at the lattice tower structure on the right, which represents the, the um, represents IFTI's work. And um, we had one SODAR that we moved to two locations and that, that makes up the, the nine sites that we've talked about. Here's the, the scope of the project. I kind of summarized it earlier on, but the, the goal was taking those nine sites, you know, connecting it to a, a marrying it to a, a model and, um, and then developing a data set where we had a three kilometer resolution. And then we uploaded it into a, a um, GIS tool that we call the Renewable Energy Data Explorer. And uh, I encourage you to go online and, and look at that tool. And uh, from that, uh, you're able to graphically identify where the, the wind resource is the strongest and overlay other GIS data layers like a uh, transmission system, transmission lines, and see where they intersect and say, well, maybe that's a good site for looking for wind. So we talked a little bit about this. Any questions so far? I've been talking. Um, while you're thinking about whether you have a question, I'm gonna open up this water because it's hot up here under these lights. Yes. 
How far back? Oh, at the beginning. Well, I'm going. Am I going the wrong direction? I'm going the wrong direction. Here, let's do this this way. So, I, I, I guess the. This one here. Right. And so, uh, and I guess I'm jumping to the, the end as I get ready to go back to the middle, but um, I think that was one of the, the goals of our first phase work was, is there enough potential to meet your vision, your policy goal? And, and we think the answer is yes. Of course, there, yeah. Clearly, Clearly, it's not achieved, right? But but what has been achieved, I guess, was our our sub goal, yes. right, of, of showing real data so you can make a data driven decision. Which is, does it make sense to move forward with when? Is there really any potential? And so that was our our project goal. Maybe it's not your country goal, but it's our project goal to actually get some data so that you can make some decisions. And I'd like to think that that we've accomplished that part. So you're, you're, what's the question? Just to comment on why? Why that? You have not talked about the environment. You have not given warning to the people here. The EPO install coal and nuclear. What the government is taking a plan? If this happens, what will happen about our environment? That is the most important question. Why don't we Right, right. Well, um, you know, we've said this in other, other meetings with uh, government officials um, that it, it's interesting to note that, the, that most of the world is trying to scale back on fossil fuel generation, right? And it is a little surprising that when we come here, we see goals of, of increasing fossil fuel generation. So it seems like there's two pushes where you've got, you've got a component of the government that wants to continue to move forward with with fossil fuel, and then you've got another component that wants to increase um, increase wind and solar. So that's certainly a, a policy debate that I'm sure you're going you're gonna to have. It's not a unique debate uh, uh, that others have had um, decades ago. Hopefully, you know you get past that, and you can find common ground, and, and you move forward with with one generation goal. But uh, we're we're biased. We think that you know I, I think that. I think um, that uh, a diversified generation mix makes sense, right? Um, right now, I don't think that we have the, the, the technology uh, to go 100% renewable. You need to have a, a good uh, port, you need to have a generation mix that, that uh, is a diversified portfolio that gives you benefits of, of uh, dispatchable, um, uh, natural gas um, or dispatchable hydro and and there's some battery technology that's starting to mature and that can be a, a way that you can dispatch on you know at, on from four to six hours eight hours they're still trying to get past eight hours uh, right now Th those are technologies that are being evaluated um, I think a lot of for most com countries they're not moving forward with with, with fossil. No, I'm saying they're not moving forward with fossil. They're moving forward with um, renewables and trying to increase that that uh, component of their generation mix. So uh, I hope that that uh, is a path that you guys take at some point in time here in the near future. But that it's not a 
debate that's unique, though. I mean, every country had it. The United States had it. Um, and um, um, they, they, they had that same debate in Europe. And so it's not unique. I'm, I'm sure eventually they'll get some, some common ground. Yeah, yeah, why don't you add some more um, thoughts? Just as an anecdote, I work in uh, Pakistan as well, and Pakistan was um, suffering rolling blackouts, so they didn't have enough power for years. They were in a deficit. And so the reason was not the transmission system, it was that there just wasn't enough generation. And um, so they were sort of desperate to get any power they could China offered to come in and provide some economic support for a number of infrastructure efforts, including building some coal plants. And they have a little bit of coal in Pakistan. And so China said, we'll help you develop, mine the coal and we'll import the rest from China. We'll build a railroad to get to the plant, the coal uh, power plant. We'll build a transmission line to get to the cities. Um, Qatar is selling uh, re, you know, regasified liquefied natural gas. So there's an RLNG, there's LNG terminal, and then a regasification terminal, and they are building up gas power plants. So over the, the years, in order to get these contracts, Pakistan has signed um, must-run contracts. So the capacity factor for these plants are guaranteed to be 60%, 80%, some, some capacity factor. And just now, in 2019, they're finally in the black, just by a little bit. They have sort of enough power. Well, now they're looking at wind and solar and saying, oh, it's finally cheap. They have good wind there. They have good sun there. And they have a new prime minister as of last August who's really wanting to see renewables take off. And so they're going to push for 20% generation by renewables by 2030. That will, that's what they're proposing for the new policy. And the, the naysayers are like, well, you know, we're already in, in contract with these other coal and gas plants we're going to have stranded assets, we call them. Let's look at how much it would cost to buy out these contracts or renegotiate them. I mean, it, it's like, oh dear, what did we do? We were so power hungry. We were willing to sign any contract. And now they're having some second thoughts. So you need to you know, be sort of forward looking and think about what makes sense economically as well as for the environment. Now, Bangladesh is in an interesting position because you, your country, is already vulnerable to flooding because it sits so low and to typhoons because of the path that it's in from traditional meteorological systems, weather systems traditionally coming through and harming your country. Sometimes it's quite difficult. And if the climate warms, you're going to have more of these problems. So you know how important it is to minimize the carbon in the atmosphere. So we would hope that Bangladesh would not be looking for coal generation. Yes, maybe nuclear. Yes, maybe, um, maybe gas, but in Pakistan, you know, one of the things that happened last year was the International Monetary Fund said, hey, your balance of trade is upside down. You only have two months of cash reserves to pay for the fuel for your power generation, the coal, the gas, and the oil that you're importing. This is a problem. We're going to increase your, your interest rate for the money we're loaning you. And so, you know, again, they're, they're paying for it. So think about that. Think about the balance of trade. This is important. Your wind and your sun is your own. You don't have to pay any other country for that. Thanks, Barbara. Chime in anytime. I'm having some back issues here today, so I'm going to sit and and uh, um, work the the screen. So again. Um, I'm not sure you know, this particular presentation was was for um, 
the various the various divisions within the government of Bangladesh last May to show them in in a lot of detail um, everything we did with the project. I'm not sure that that level of detail is what what this audience is is interested in. So again, I want to bounce past a couple of, a number of these slides, more than a couple, and and if you see something that interests you, uh, let let me know. Um, uh, a little bit about the, the locations that we uh, cited uh, MET stations in. Um, and, and we want to get this message out there. A lot of people looked at our, our final report or looked at the Renewable Energy Data Explorer, the online uh, GIS tool that I referred to earlier, and thought that we selected the nine best locations for wind in Bangladesh. And that, that, is, not, that is not accurate. What we did was we located nine geographically diverse locations in Bangladesh to collect uh, wind speeds, direction, temperature, you know, meteorological data, because it was important to get that geographic diversity and marry that into the computer model so that we could produce a, a nationwide wind map. And that's another thing, that I guess, another takeaway, a point that I'd like to make. In the, in, um, uh, well, I'd say probably 10 years ago and, and, and further back, whenever you did a wind resource, resource assessment, it was a PDF map, and you got a piece of paper, basically, and that was the results. That was the, the main deliverable. And, um, and we think, you know, not that we, we have moved past that now, and we're trying to, you know, educate uh, um, uh, new decision makers, uh, both in the United States and, and abroad, that database decisions, data uh, tools are more important than a, a PDF map, just a, a two-dimensional map. And so the, the databases that we created uh, are available to everybody, publicly available on the Renewable Energy Data Explorer, reexplorer.com, um, I think is, is that? re-explorer.com, those that are taking notes. And again, I think this uh, presentation will be made available to you um, uh, later. But in, in that tool, you can access a number of different databases. You can access the raw data that came from those nine uh, towers that were located um, uh, across the country. You can, lo you can look at the, um, download the actual computer model that was informed and adjusted based on those, on the data from those nine sites. And, um, and there's a third, um, there's a, uh, a third data set. It's actually the raw data um, unscrubbed. <coughs> so when we use the term scrubbed, we, uh, we're referring to a kind of a quality control process where you, you look at uh, the, the data and say, well, it, it rained you know, during these three days and the, and the anemometer was affected, so I'm going to delete that data. Um, and, and a whole host of other maybe mechanical issues or weather issues that icing in some, of course, we didn't have icing here in Bangladesh, but that can be another, another reason for scrubbing the, the data. Some people uh, that get really into the, the data say, I want to use my own quality control criteria. So we thought it was important to, to create a data set that was unscrubbed and allow you to take that data and make your own estimates of what um, quality control system you want to apply to it. Uh, if you want to use our scrub data, we identify the criteria that was used for that too. So there's three different data sets and, and I think it's uh, very uh, valuable to look at all three and, and, uh, and make your own choices as to how you want to use them. All available on the re-explorer.com. Is that org? O-R-G. Oh, is it O-R-G? Yeah. Okay, okay. Should correct me the first time. <laughs> Not .com, .org. So, so on those nine sites, and I talked a little bit about that. Um, we uh, we thought it was important to work with communities to 
to get a, a good handle on um, uh, not only where the good, where the best location was, where there were willing landowners, um, but we had to get we had to go through a permitting process, and sometimes talking to to village officials was also important in getting their buy-in. I think that same process um, will need to occur when we cite uh, turbines as well. I think that's that's really important. So that we're we like to kind of highlight the community aspect of of um, uh, renewable energy, both in the siting side and uh, through ongoing um, operations. It's good to start with a, a a good relationship with the community officials. Um, land agreements. <laughs> we've um, we found that through our conversations, especially this week, but in past weeks too, that uh, um, land is a, is a key, uh, land control is a, a difficult and key aspect to any, um, any project. And with a wind project, when you're a utility scale wind project, when you're thinking about siting uh, 20 turbines, 30, 40 turbines, and you need large tracts of land for a, uh, a project, you're going to be dealing with many landowners, right? Because the parcels are, are often so small. And uh, again, it's, it's important to work with your landowners. And, and for our project, we, we uh, um, uh, told them they didn't have to work with us. You know, we could go work with a neighbor. But if they did work with us, we'd build them a small little uh, guard shack, and we usually always hired the landowner or a family member of the landowner to to uh, be watching over the tower or the sodar, and they could uh, do so in the uh, shadow of or shade, I should say, of of a guard shack that we left for them, and end up uh, you know being a a facility they could use as a tool shed when we took down the the tower. So I think they were very appreciative of that. Thank you. Um, this is just a little summary of the schedule. Um, and here are the observation locations. Shanpur was the uh, first location where we broke ground. I can't hear you. So you want... You want me to talk about the timeline? You just want to look at it? I'll just briefly say that the timeline was um, uh, uh, originally supposed to be such that, that we collected um, data for over two years. And that's a, a key number, uh, the number two because when you're trying to project finance um, wind projects, they want to see two years' worth of data. And so that was, that was the reason why two years was the key number. But because there were a number of strikes uh, and some political um, concerns when we started back in 2013, uh, we had to, and then we had the rainy season, um, that delayed construction or erection um, a number of times that combination pushed our our entire timeline out over four years and so we had uh, some sites where we had three and a half years worth of, of data and some sites where we had um, uh, a year uh, so I think we had two sites that uh, we had a year or a little bit more those were the two SODAR sites and that was uh, by design, we always thought we were going we to have uh, just one year with each of those sites. That was Anani Beach and um, Rangpur. And we had one site, which was Shanpur, uh, where we had a 60-meter tower. And then the other six sites were 80-meter towers, 82 meters to be exact. And you had a question. Ask. Oh, thank you. Uh, you talked about the nine diverse places uh, uh, of site selection uh, and uh, seven places you put anemometers and two for sonar. 
was there uh, like what factor led you to choose two different technologies and why two solars one uh, sonars so tars. Uh, and uh, so tars? Um, i'm sorry so tar uh, and what are the like accuracy percentage of both compare if you compare them both like what led you to choose seven uh, anemometer for seven places and so tar for two places Sure, should be glad to chat about that. So, I add an additional question related with this. Uh, you have selected these nine places from the typical meteorological data from uh, historical data index of analysis, right? How do you select these nine places? I mean, primarily, you have some parameters. Sounds like that's the same question. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, uh, I'll, 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 I'll talk through that. He has, he has talked about two different technology you have used. There's how. Right, uh, right. But I I'm, I'm talking about questions. how do you select these locations? I, I will mean, I will talk about that. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. So on the uh, I'll start with the number nine. Uh, basically, it was it was budget. I mean, with if you're a data person, the more data, the better, right? So if we could have had a budget to put up fifty, we would have put up fifty, but we didn't have a budget to put up fifty. So it was looking at the budget uh, and then and and determining how we could manage um, uh, from that budget a computer modeling task and a, a data collection task, and so that's why we came. We got to the, the number nine, uh, and we think that we think that nine was. Um, you know, I think that that gives you a a good sense of what the the um, wind speeds were in 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 all regions. Also, when we were looking at kind of a a criteria for site selection, um, it was our thought that that and it turns out it turned out to be true that. Um, Probably a high probability some people are going to want to locate if the wind was was, was decent they're going to want to locate a project at that exact site because of the fact that they had a good start on on data collection so what what other aspects of a site make a good wind site besides a strong wind resource well being near transmission so we made sure that that uh, most all of those sites were with an eyesight of a transmission line. There's a, there was an exception, I think, uh, maybe, maybe even two, but seven of those for sure were, were within uh, a kilometer or two of a, of a transmission line. So that was what went into picking the um, sites. Be close to transmission and, um, uh, and then provide uh, geographic diversity. And then, and then also kind of a step, a layer, uh, um, digging a, a layer deeper on on diversity, we also were looking for um, topographical uh, diversity because Bangladesh is so flat everywhere. We wanted to um, mix it up a little bit, and uh, out uh, by Silet, you know, there's some there's some hills, and we put the I, I call it the Mirzapur site, and Ifti calls it the Silet site. I, they're uh, one and the same, um, but it's at a at a higher location. We were uh, trying to see if there was some some stronger winds on the hills that were out in in tea country, right? And then we we certainly assumed that there were going to be strong winds off of the water, and so we wanted to have three sites that were close to the coast and kind of heavily weighted towards the coastal region by using three sites down in that southeast with Anani Beach and um, Parquet Beach, Sitakunda, and fourth, the fourth site, if you want to call Shanpur, it's not really a, on the beach, but it's, it's close, it's on that south end. So we, we assume that the, the wind speeds, if you look around the world, uh, probably stronger in that area, and that's, those were the, the criteria used for uh, site selection. Now, technology. Um, we, we see a trend um, uh, uh, in the industry of moving towards SODAR units uh, and LIDAR units uh, because of the fact that um, 
uh, they're mobile. And you can put them on a trailer, and you can uh, easily move them around from location to location. And, and if you uh, have a need to um, look at multiple sites, uh, there can be an advantage for a mobile um, collection technology. The downside of, of SODAR, which, which we knew this was a, a downside going into it, is that uh, when you um, are in a, a rainy season, that particular set of data can be um, um, uh, uh, damaged. You know? and, and so we wanted, to, we wanted to do a little bit of a test to see how well the SODAR would would stand up in a area, in a tropical area that had uh, a lot of rain. And uh, I think we got, good, we got good data. We also um, took the SODAR and put it right beside the Rashahi Tower for a month and co-located it there and measured, made sure that the measurements matched each other. So um, a little bit of, of testing that technology in this particular wet climate was the was the goal of of um, of choosing um, uh, the SODAR and and back to budget again, we thought we didn't have enough money to uh, have nine towers, so we could kind of you know check a couple of different boxes. We could get a, a SODAR unit and and use it on two locations and possibly use it on, on a third if we wanted to have a, um, um, a second phase data collection uh, campaign. So that was the reason for those, uh, those choices. And yet, yeah. Last year, University of California Berkeley published a wind map. Uh, do you have a link with that? Uh, University of California, Berkeley, last year published a wind map uh, over Bangladesh. Do you have a connection with that? So the University of California, Berkeley, published a wind map of Bangladesh, is that what you said? Uh, yes, uh, last year. Uh, uh, I've not seen it, but... Rael, uh, uh, they are Institute of Renewable Energy, R-A-E-L. Um, I'm wondering how they, how they, they developed very, it. Uh, very uh, few place for wind potential in Hobigons only. Mm -hmm. A very uh, sound uh, potential for uh, wind resource in Bangladesh. Well, it's, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. I'm, I'm not aware of that one, but I, from our discussion with uh, the power division, the government of Bangladesh, our wind map is the most extensive because of the fact that, again, we use nine measurement sites along with the modern day, um, uh, modern day model. What, what you'll find with a lot of different um, uh, wind maps, as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to disparage other wind maps. They, they work hard at trying to, you know, their goal is different than ours, right? Their, their goal was, uh, I'm guessing, that their goal was to provide information maybe to a number of different countries. So maybe they use just a computer model, because you can sit at your desk and run a computer model, no, never have to go visit the country, and develop a, a, a data set. Um, but if you're, familiar, if you're all scientists here, or, or, or tech, have technical degrees, you know there's um, an error window, right? Uh, there's an error um, uh, associated with every data set, even ours. And so our goal was to pinch that, you know, squeeze that down so the error was, was less because of the fact that we had uh, nine measuring sites. So I'm guessing theirs isn't as accurate as ours would be my guess. So I think I might know what he's talking about. And I don't think it's UC Berkeley. I think it might be Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And they took um, data from an organization called SMAP that is funded by the World Bank. SMAP has um, used satellites around the world to model data. And it's just as Mark said, SMAP covers resource data around the world, but it's just modeled from satellite imagery. So um, that's great to just get a general sense of what resources might be available in various countries. 
But when you get a ground station measurement, wind with the Met Tower, or solar with a pyranometer that measures the irradiance, then you can validate or not your algorithm that uses the satellite data to project wind and solar resource data. And in, in the case, and, and so just to be clear, so they, uh, Lawrence Berkeley put that data into a tool that they have online that you can um, download into a spreadsheet format and uh, modify assumptions for how to access the technical potential of, of a country. Um, so it's quite um, um, almost like open source. You can modify all the things. So it, it's, it's, it's fun to play with that tool. Uh, we take our work and we put it into the tool that's renewableenergyexplorer.org. It's a different way of looking at the data. That's a geospatial software that's publicly available. Um, there's another organization called IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Organization or Association out of uh, Abu Dhabi. And they, they too have a solar site as well as a separate wind site. So there's a couple different ways to access data. But in Bangladesh's case, this, this project was specifically to validate the algorithm and modify the algorithm based on what the ground station measurements said. So that's quite different. Um, the idea was that for, um, not only will you get a better projection of the wind resource in country, but for the areas that are very close to the towers, as Mark described, you could take that data to an investment bank and say, here's my proof that I can build a project here. Yeah. And, I, and I actually, thanks for that. I, I didn't know that it came from my arena or SMAP, but I've actually sat in on meetings, phone calls, conference calls with both of those organizations with their work and heard what their goals were for their maps. And they were quite clear that their goal was to look at, at a country from, or, or actually regions of the world from a 50,000 foot level and say, hey, generally, where's, where's their wind? Or do you have a, you know, a certain um, uh, potential for, for wind? And they said that, and they were aware of um, our project because they asked me to give a presentation on the Bangladesh wind campaign and they said, oh, yeah, Ours in no way substitutes for a national wind uh, assessment program or a national wind campaign. Ours is looking at regions and it's just identifying, you know, is there wind or isn't there? And, and it's not really diving down at that lower level. Uh, and it would suggest if you got wind in your, in your country, based on the regional um, map that they created from the satellite data, then you would want to take that next step, which is, putting up MET towers or SODAR and actually exploring it further, which is what we're doing. So they were up here at this level, that was their goal, and we came down here. So, any other questions about that, these topics? I'll move on. So, um, back to the locations, and again, uh, this is just summarizing the, the amount of time, um, the amount of months that we measure data at each one of those sites. Uh, Shanpur um, was our actual first site that we broke ground on. Um, Rashahi, uh, I mentioned earlier that we co-located the SODAR at the Rashahi site. That was a 82-meter um, tower. What? Yes. So SODAR, okay, um, if, let me go to another slide since there's interest in SODAR. Go back, I jump past it. So this is the slide on the SODAR. So SODAR is an acronym, stands for SONIC, S-O is the SONIC, uh, D is detection, and ranging, sonic detection and ranging. Remote sensing is a, is a more general umbrella term 
which LIDAR also uh, fits underneath remote sensing. So LIDAR is uh, uh, light detection and ranging. And it uses a laser instead of, uh, instead of a sonar. And so both of them kind of work kind of the same way, only with you know, different technology. And, and it shoots, as you can see with this, <clears throat> I should have you come up here and explain this, Ifty. So he helped, uh, he was the one that deployed it. But th it, it actually shoots a, a sonar up in this cone. You can picture a cone. And it can give you data at 200 meters off the ground. And, um, uh, and you can see it's just, uh, um, it's kind of narrow at the base of, of, the, of its span of, of detection and, and wide up here at the top. And you get the same data that you would get from a conventional meteorological tower that's using anemometers and, and wind vanes. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's gaining a lot of traction in the, in the project development community because of the fact that it's mobile. And you can reuse it, and it's, you can deploy it in, what, how long did it take? You have to, once you, uh, once you set it up on the, on the um, platform, how long did it take, half a day or a, a full? Six hours, okay, so six, six, six hours to get it set up, and then you walk away and start collecting the data. So uh, very quick compared to a MET tower, how long did that take? Two months. Two months. <laughs> and of course, that's including all the land work probably that's attached to that too, working with landowners, because you've got multiple landowners you're working with because of the guy wires. Where here, you're just one landowner to, to set her down. So it's just... You know, again, a lot of advantages, and there's, like I said, there's some disadvantages too in wet climates, but um, that's what the, the what the SODAR is. Any additional questions on SODAR? So the the cost. Um, this was a, a revamped, uh, a refurbished one. So we bought a, a used one and and put a bunch of speakers, new speakers. Was it 20, 48 speakers? The fourteen. Okay, forty eight. I was right. Forty eight. 48 speakers, and I think all of them were, were uh, new that we replaced. The, and, um, and the cost, I think, once we got done with refurbishing was about $60,000. And uh, a um, MET tower compared to an 82-meter MET tower is, is a little over $100,000. So, and again, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, it... it uh, it can vary, but that's kind of, the, if you're looking at a brand new SODAR unit, that can be $100,000 too. What, 150? Is that what a brand new one goes for? I'm not, it's been, what? For a brand new one? Okay, well, then maybe we didn't get as much, it's good of a deal with our refurbished one. But um, uh, the point is, again, you can reuse it uh, over and over again. There's a little bit of maintenance replacing the speakers, but you can reuse it. With a MET tower, it's, it's harder to reuse once you get past five years. Um, any other questions on SODARS? Yes. Uh, hello. So it's not about SODAR, but well, closer to my uh, something very general. So I wanted to know that, um, as Ms. Barbara clarified, that it's very different to have like real um, anemometers and uh, pyro pyrometers uh, than having the satellite data. So I'm just wondering the usefulness of tools like HOMAR and um, like um, if you want to invest in a place, how, should you uh, trust on tools like HOMAR and red screen and things like this or you should um, have real setups and do year long experiments and take out the data. Yeah, so we Thank use you. Homer at NREL, and we also have another software product that we developed called Reopt. Reopt um, is available on our website for free. Homer is very cheap as well. I mean, it's pretty cheap, and you can do a trial. But Reopt is another one you can play with on the website if you want. So those, both of those softwares, just to let other people know, are 
kind of targeting behind the meter installation. So they're not targeting big utility scale projects that we're talking about for a wind farm, nor would you use a Homer or REOP to, to really build out a big solar farm. But in terms of like figuring out just what your watts per square meter is, so um, Homer actually goes back to NREL's database that we've developed for solar assessment um, around the world. What? It's, it's called PV Watts. So that's, the, that's where it targets. You know, it pulls data from PV Watts. So it's just an estimate. Now, typically, when you're doing a behind the meter installation, you're typically doing solar instead of wind, right? Because wind is, you know, it's just lends itself to these big towers, one megawatt, 1.5, two, three, four megawatts each. There's some small wind towers, right? Little couple hundred kilowatts, and that's getting more attention, but mostly you're using solar. Solar doesn't vary as much as wind, right? I mean, your solar irradiance it's easier to use satellite imagery to estimate a project's solar irradiance than to use satellite imagery to estimate a project's wind because wind is so based on the, the terrain, the, the, the micro terrain, and the satellite, you can't see that terrain. You're looking from above. So it's way more of an estimate, and your wind production will vary if you move your tower by you know, a few hundred meters close to the edge of the mountain, if there's a cliff, the wind will increase from shear versus back from the edge of the, you know, there's so many micro details, but solar, not so much. And, you know, in short, HOMA really is like a power system design and optimization tool, whereas this is more, um, I mean, it's an assessment tool. You're trying to assess how, what the resource is. So there's slightly different purposes, like the two tools are just, different objectives. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly. Yes. Oh. Yeah, so I'm, I'll just repeat the question. So the, your question was, is this data, are these data available? For simulation, right? Is this data set available? And in short, yes. So if you go to the website, this data set is available. Yeah. So this data is available in the tool that's re-explorer.org. SAM is System Advisory Model that uses PV watts irradiance data also. They're all tied together as far as the resource data for solar. SAM is made to look at um, the details of a project, right, and how you would sort of scope out a project. Um, so that's sort of a different purpose than Homer or Reopt, which is looking at um, like a microgrid and how to modify um, existing backup generation that you have depending on what your tariff structure is, right? So you, you wanna know how much you're paying and what sort of incentives there are. So again, they're all sort of slightly different purposes for the software tools, but from NREL for free, you can access SAM PV Watts, Reopt, and reexplorer.org. Yeah. It's one of the things that um, uh, NREL prides itself on is providing uh, open um, access to all the tools and data sets that we um, create through collaborations with with um, folks like yourselves. So, so that was that was Rasha He. I was kind of going through the, the different. Let's try to stand here for a while. Um, the different sites, um, Sitakunda, um, another 82 meter tower. Uh, we had two years worth of data there. Uh, Parquet Beach. This one, I guess, one little interesting side story is that. Um, there was an, an old wind resource assessment that uh, uh, I don't know how many total towers they used, but one of their towers was at Parquet Beach. 
and they had uh, left, took their tower down, but left their concrete uh, structures up. And, um, and the results of their study, because it was so, so small, and it, I don't think, I'm not even sure they even used a computer model. I think they just uh, took data, um, and they didn't take data for very long, and they thought there was no wind. <clears throat> we actually came in and used, um, do we use all of their, we, how many of their, their um, cement structures did we use, IFTI? We used seven? Okay. So we used seven of, of the existing structures to, to, um, to build on. It was right by the water. And was this the one, um, I like to tell the little side stories that are kind of fun. For, was this the one that almost got hit by a, a ship? <laughs> so there's a picture here that's not in this presentation, but there's a typhoon that you guys had. Uh, what year was that? Was that 16? 16, and, um, and it, it, it washed a, a big um, barge ship, uh, container ship up on shore, and it almost hit this tower. Um, we've got a really interesting picture. I don't know if it was from someone from IFTI's team that took the picture and sent it to me. He said, you know, the tower almost got hit by a ship. That's kind of, kind of funny. Um, it, it survived. And Maiman Singh, um, uh, kind of up in the central, slightly north central part of the, the country. A little more than two months or two years worth of data. Uh, Mangala, and this was, uh, this was, I guess a little story attached to, to Mangala was uh, we were working with the, the power division and showing them the locations that we were recommending. And uh, I had a site up by Jasor originally picked out. And they said, you know, we're going to be building a lot, new, a lot of new transmission down around Mangala because we've got a, I think it was a power plant that they were planning on building there. And so they, they were going to have more transmission built. So it might be better to have a uh, tower closer to where this new transmission is going to be built. And we said, okay, we can do that. And so we changed our location down to, to Mangala. Uh, did not get a chance to visit uh, the Sunderbunds, but we plan to do that on a future visit. Um, Mirzapur, um, this is in tea country. This is also called Silet. And um, uh, large tea um, uh, plantation, my understanding is that it was, um, or that it is government land, but it's a long-term lease for the, that the, the tea plantation has on the government land for their tea, and it just required a lot of uh, extra hand-holding with the landowner to get permission to um, uh, actually site the tower there. But all problems are solvable. Anani Beach, so back down to the southeast corner. Um, I was amazed when I saw Ifti's throne that he created for, for this sodar. Um, it was uh, uh, quite impressive. And the reason why it's so high is we wanted to make sure that, that during a, a flood or a typhoon that uh, it didn't get overwashed. Now, if you didn't have that issue, if we weren't citing this sodar next to the water, we just would park it in a field and it wouldn't be so, so difficult. Of course, this required that we, we get it built up kind of high, but um, uh, it, it also survived, and there was a big ramp that was created uh, to roll it up there. The other location that I'd re referenced earlier was Rangpur, up in the north northwest corner of the country. And as you can see, we, we uh, didn't build quite the throne that was built uh, at Anani Beach. This was a little bit easier, but wanted to keep it off the ground. Um, well, it's just short of two years' worth of data at, at Rangpur. Um, documentation, another, another key aspect of this project. Uh, I've, I've talked with um, Harness Energy, who uh, worked with, with IFTI on, 
on uh, siting these these projects and um, and installing them and um, they work with a lot of different wind developers across the, the U.S. And, and they've also worked internationally as well. And they, they cited that uh, it could be worth just the documentation of your wind resource campaign could, could be worth 0 0.1 to 0.2% on your project financing. And that's something that I've noticed when we were looking at uh, the Philippines and some other different uh, uh, projects and they showed the documentation or lack thereof of their existing MET towers that they wanted to pair with, marry with uh, our computer model. And um, there was no documentation. There was no commissioning uh, report. There, there really was very little information. And when you have poor information and you don't do it the right way and use quality um, uh, contractors to do that work, then the data uh, becomes less valuable. And in some cases, it can be, you know, I hate to say this, but it can be, there can be almost zero value in, in some, some uh, data campaigns when they don't have any um, uh, documentation associated with the, with the project. And so we made sure that we had really good document, documentation on, on this one. Um, we also provided training. Um, uh, we noticed that there were uh, a, a number of climbers that uh, like to free climb or climb on, on only one, um, one, one uh, uh, tie to the, to the uh, tower. And uh, Taj and his team uh, at Harness uh, worked with IFTI and, and his team. I think you always had two points of connection and had a, created a circle of safety around each tower and, and actually even um, uh, created a, and, I, and I'm not taking any credit for this, I'm just uh, reporting, but uh, I think there was an incentive program for people that were safe. And, and uh, I think that worked out very well and, and it was interesting to, to see uh, at each site sitting down with the, with the team and making sure that uh, we were safe. Um, this is going to, part, uh, parts of these next uh, slides are going to not only be over your head, they're going to be over mine. Uh, when we gave this presentation in, um, in May, um, uh, I handed this over to the computer modeler and he, and he described the, or presented the next set of slides. But uh, I, I think on one, one interesting way to uh, describe the modeling work. And again, I'm gonna jump past a number of them, but this first slide I think is, is a good visual where you really looked at, at the, a larger area um, and you take a data set that, that's covering a very large area and then you nest down and get tighter and tighter and tighter with your accuracy and it, and it improves the, the reliability of the, of the data. So you're not just creating a model of Bangladesh, you're, compl you're, you're um, uh, generating a model for a larger area. And the reason why that's beneficial is because weather patterns don't just follow the borders of your country, right? Weather patterns, uh, weather systems uh, are being uh, influenced by um, other weather systems, and if you look at a wider area and then bring the, the model down, you'll capture those influences from other weather, weather patterns. This, hopefully no one has questions about these slides, because I probably won't be able to answer them. Um, This one, um, so the word observation, when you see observation, uh, that's the, the modeler's word for data collection. So when I talk about measured data, uh, they use the word observation. They mean the same thing. So observation or measured data, the same thing. And it's, this is describing a little bit about the art of taking the model data 
and marrying it to the measured data and, and making those, those adjustments. I just talked about, so actually, this is, I, I, I drove, I pointed at the wrong um, first square. The first square is not here. The first square is here. <clears throat> so it's looking at all the weather patterns that encompass, you know, all of India and all to the, the east, and then you're nesting down from D1 to D2 to, to D3. And again, it's trying to um, account for and take, in, uh, take into account all the different larger weather patterns across the world. Barb, can you speak to any more of that than I just did? Okay, yeah. What, what, what's our time? It's seven. So, so um, the question was, is this, is this part interesting or do you want me to, what, what, what's interesting to you? What do you want to know about wind? We could just kind of open this up a little bit. Okay, so. So here's, here's a good slide to talk about results. So I talked, to, we've talked numerous times about the Renewable Energy Data Explorer and this is a screenshot of that uh, tool with that data set uh, uploaded into it. And let me just, I'll come back to this slide for a second. Let me. This is a better slide for that. So, so this was, um, this is the, the modeled adjusted data set. So when I say adjusted, that means that we took the, the measured data from nine sites and we adjusted the model. And so this is the best, this is the best data set, I think. And um, the uh, little icons here are the locations of each of the, each of the measuring sites, all the data, the, of the data collection sites. And these are anemometers. They're not X's, they're anemometers. And um, you can see in the dark blue, that's stronger wind. And in the white, that's lighter, um, um, weaker wind. Um, and in the tool, you can click any one of these data layers. Here are the three main um, um, tabs of the tool. The first one you want to focus on and get comfortable with is the data layer. So you click on that, and it gives you this drop down. Excuse me, drop down menu. And you click on on wind resource, and you can uh, show a map that is um, uh, looking at 120. That the wind speed is at 120 meters, 100 meters, 80, and 30. So that's why it's a data tool. Remember earlier when I was talking about in the old days, you just had a PDF map, you just had one piece of paper. Here, it's, it's a data tool. So you can look at all sorts of different uh, altitudes or elevations of, of data. Um, Mark, let me just point out that I think that the Lawrence Berkeley data could be seen if you just click on the World Bank layer. So, I could be wrong because I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but it's possible that the map that you've seen is the, if you highlight the World Bank layer and drop it down, you could look at that data instead of the modeled data. Does that make sense? Okay. To compare, but again, this is the better data set, so I wouldn't use the World Bank data set, I'd use this one. But it's a good point. We, we showed uh, we tried to load this up with as much um, information as possible, and um, um, as you can see, we turned off. Our model did have, you know, did capture about 20 or 30 kilometers of offshore um, data. We turned it off for this screenshot, but you could turn it on and look at what the offshore uh, wind resource is, and what's. What's really cool about this entire tool is the ability to layer in 
other data sets. So as a wind developer, when I put my old um, hat on, the first two pieces of information you want are where's the strongest wind and where's the most, where's the, the where's transmission? Where's the, the largest transmission line relative to that uh, wind resource? You know, where do they cross? And then you look at population density, environmentally sensitive areas, and all these other things, but you first start off with two points of, of, of information, wind resource, transmission. Look to where they cr cross and that's, and then create maybe you've 10 different areas where you see that, that that crossing occurs and then start narrowing down based on those other uh, criteria uh, and get down to you know your top three or four sites. Um, and I don't know if you're planning on going into this, but there's also um, the analysis and downloads. You can look at the technical potential um, where you can sort of make assumptions of uh, certain parameters of your wind and your solar to get to the country's technical potential. These, uh, these other um, <clears throat> these other tabs, if you click legend, then it will give you the, the wind speed ranges for the colors. And, uh, and if you hit query, you can actually take a query box and say, all right, um, well, if, you, if I click infrastructure, I'm gonna get a drop-down menu that will have transmission lines. I'll click transmission. Transmission layer lines will show up on here. I'll say, all right, here's a transmission line that, that um, um, uh, intersects with this dark blue area. I want the data from that area. So you can take that query box draw a square on there and then download that actual data into an Excel spreadsheet and use it however you want. So I can't because this is just a screenshot. I, I don't know if I, I, I don't think I'll have time for that. So again, this, this, um, uh, This presentation, IFTI is going to make available to you. And on this particular slide, it has all these links that you might want to uh, click on and, and jump around. Well, and then also to add the final, rep uh, sorry. the final report is also on the NREL website now. So you should be able to find that as well. Mm. So on the next steps, um, and which is why we're here this week, is trying to kind of narrow down our, our, our um, scope on how we're going to support um, the government of Bangladesh through USAID funding. Um, and, and we think uh, certainly getting a better handle on what the installed costs are, are, are important. Now, we're not going to go out there and, and, uh, and get bids ourselves, but we think that we can help support uh, the procurement process by making sure that the bids are well understood and transparent and the proposals are of high quality, which will increase the success of, of these first set of projects. And, and that's all going to help um, uh, uh, help at, at bullet number one. Uh, there are some um, uh, parts of the government that are, are interested in taking additional wind measurements. Uh, in other areas of the country, and we can help with that. Um, and I think it's, it's needed. Uh, understanding the interconnection process. We, we think that, you know, when, when I was doing development, uh, it was very difficult, I'll get you in just a second, it was very difficult uh, uh, to find all the information that was required to make a, a project come together. It's a big puzzle, and you were talking to one person over here to understand about transmission and that, that process, what kind of study do I do, how much, what, do I, what kind of form do I fill out, how much money is it gonna cost, how long is it gonna take, uh, what is the wind resource, um, what kind of publicly available data might, be, might exist for, for wind, uh, permitting, who do I talk to for, for permitting. And so one of the things that we had suggested was 
creating a, a one-stop uh, information uh, desk, uh, electronic, an e-desk, for, for lack of a better word, um, where, where all this information that, that a developer might need could be at, at one location. So a link to the ready tool and these data sets would be on this electronic uh, website hosted by the government of Bangladesh. Um, the uh, interconnection guidelines would be located there with a point of contact and a phone number and just providing all that information in one spot because that's something that we're hearing from uh, the private sector here in Bangladesh is they're not sure where to go for all of those different steps and so we think putting all that information in one location will be helpful. Green shirt. How many megawatts we can install in a 20 years frame and what will be the capacity factor? And I have another question. Uh, the most popular arguments here are these intermittent, uh, intermittent energies will disturb the grid. Can you explain this? So the first question is how many megawatts uh, will be installed in 20 years? Um, that's going to be up to you. Practically? Theoretically. So, so I mean, that's a, that's a loaded question, right? I mean, there's, that's, a, that's a debate that everyone has a, has a different number in their head. The, the easy question, or the easy answer to that question is, the goal is 10%, right? And I am confident that in 20 years, with, with political will, you'll be able to reach that goal. Uh, we've shown that, that if you, um, with the caveat of not fully understanding what the installed cost is because you haven't done one project yet, because so there's going to be a lot of, of um, challenges on transportation. Uh, how do you get the components, these very large components, to the project site and your road system is, is not real strong here. And so those are gonna be a lot of challenges to overcome. Again, I think all challenges and, and obstacles are overcomable, but you need to do the first one first. And then you start seeing what those solutions are. Maybe a solution might be um, uh, either a consortium of, of investors and developers or the government or a combination of both creates a a, um, a, uh, a a dock, a large dock and marina, and you float these components to these high wind resource areas, and that there's an easy way to unload those components, and it serves a dozen projects over 20 years. That could be a, a, a solution. Maybe it's improving the roadways, a uh, major highway, and maybe some key artery roads so that you can get those components to those locations. Maybe it's a combination of both. That's going to determine what the high end of that megawatt range is going to be. Uh, if, if you looked at just the wind resource, absent solving the transmission uh, logistics, I think we showed that there's, you know, um, what, was, what was the number, 30,000? 30, what was that number that we had? Um, there was a, there's, there's a, a over 20,000 megawatts of potential over five and a half um, meters per second. But that's such a theoretical number because it's not taking into account the cost of installation. But if the cost of installation was what was um, uh, uh, um, similar to India, a, a neighbor, then you could get a lot of megawatts in. But that's, but that's, that's a theoretical number because it's also not taking into account um, uh, load growth, right? I mean, if you have a if you have a, a load of of um, uh, twenty thousand megawatts in tw by twenty in, in twenty years, you're not going to want to install fifty thousand megawatts of, of wind, right? There's going to be some export opportunities probably, but you're not you got to you know that those kinds of numbers are going to ebb and sway based on. Export opportunities based on 
load based on the generation portfolio goals uh, that the government has. You're not going to be 100% wind. Uh, you're going to have to have a mix of wind and, and gas. But um, um, that's why that answer isn't really easy. But the first, I come back to the first part of the answer, which is you can easily meet your 10% your goal. And it would be our hope, if you look at trends in other countries, trends in the United States, when that 10% goal was set and they hit it, they realized this wasn't so bad. We solved these problems. Let's set another goal of 20%. And then you go to 20. Now, if we hit 20%, let's go to 30. And, and you see you know, Denmark did that. Now they're over 50%. But they started at 10. And, and so I guess that would maybe be the, the better way to answer it is that you've got enough wind uh, potential along the coast, but one, you need to understand what the costs are because of logistical challenges. And then two, you need to get that first one built. Right? And what was the second question you had? Capacity factor. So capacity factor is um, uh, to, to calculate capacity factor, you need to know the machine, right? It's, it's, it's um, dependent on the power curve of the turbine that you choose. So you can't just say the ca capacity factor is 30% because you don't know what machine you picked. So it's, you got to connect it to the machine. But we did some, some swags, some estimates, looking at a four megawatt, uh, two, actually it was two to three, um, three and a half to four megawatt machines, and we blended that power curve because we were confident that we were going to get a question like that asked us by the power division, and and I I, I think with the with the uh, wide um, rotor diameters and and taller towers, you know, I think that you can you can get capacity factors that will be um, over 30 percent. I don't know what I don't have the average number. Uh, in my head to, to give you, but I think that you would be able to get numbers that were uh, approaching 30 and over 30, depending on where you're, you're at uh, in, in the country. And there was a lot of um, areas that were at 25, and I think, I think you take that, the capacity factor is a key number when you're trying to develop price, right? So if you look at your, your spreadsheet, your pro forma spreadsheet, where you're trying to estimate price of power, uh, and the, the one I used, the very first cell was capacity factor. So you'd stick that number in there, then you gotta get a price for your turbine, then you gotta get a price for the installation of that turbine, then you gotta get a, a cost uh, estimate for your interconnection, um, and, uh, and then you gotta understand your financing costs. And that's a whole different tab, because that gets really complicated. And usually, if you take that, that number, um, and we and then compare it to the cost average cost of power uh, here in your country, which this is the question that we've asked a lot. What is the unsubsidized cost of power? And we 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 haven't gotten a, a um, uh, an answer on that yet, so I don't know what the unsubsidized cost is, but I I would guess it's somewhere over 20 cents. I've heard some people say maybe even 25 cents a kilowatt hour dollars per, per kilowatt hour? Uh, tw uh, sorry, I said that wrong. Two or, I said that wrong. So I'm, I'm so used to talking megawatt hours. Um, uh, right, so, so 20, 25 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, $250 a megawatt hour. I said that right, right? So, so if, if your price of power is that high, then I would assume that from a net capacity factor perspective, that anything over 25% would be, would hunt, would be competitive, be worth looking at to potentially develop. Oh. Because again, you're comparing to a high cost of power, right? You're right, wind does not blow uh, all the time. Um, 
It's it's variable generation. So what what what's the question? The grid integration, the uh, the grid integration, uh, like there are different uh, energy production methods. So we are getting some energy from solar, some from wind, some from uh, gases and coal. So um, no, when uh, like uh, 100 megawatt power plant uh, from wind, if the wind stop blowing, will it disturb the grid? I mean, uh, so, so this is a good integration question. And I have a grid integration expert sitting over here, yeah. so I'm going to hand this yeah. to her. But 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 yes. let me quickly say say this, and I'm going to hand it to Barbara to give a more detailed answer. Um, one one myth that is out there is that you have to back up uh, on a one-to-one -one basis your variable generation with a dispatchable generation, and that's just not that's not accurate. So I'm going to have her talk a little bit more about that. But the, the other thing that I like to say from a big picture perspective on that, that, that gets at that question or, or starts to answer that question is that so many people think that the wind generation has to be, has to look like um, uh, gas or coal. And they think that all generation has the same purpose, has the same role in the generation stack. And that's just not accurate. Every generation type has a role. And if you understood, and probably everybody in this room, room does, but there's a lot of people in the public that do not, that you've got base load generation where you turn that on and you, you know, gas or nuclear or coal and you run it all the time. And then you've got peaker plants where you, you build that not to run all the time, uh, the peaker plants, you're, you're, you're building those for a specific purpose just to fill in the, the uh, caps at the top, right? So I guess that basic understanding that generation has um, in that generation stack all has a, a role and you can use the, the benefits and the pluses of every single one of them to provide power in your system, um, that works. And we've been doing it for a really long time and we, could, we can insert wind into this mix and, and get the benefits of wind. I'm gonna hand this off to Barbara and she can answer that in more detail. So there's a couple different answers um, to that question. So on, on one hand, the more wind you have, as long as it's geographically diverse in different places, the more moderated your aggregate wind output is. Hold on one second. <coughs> So for example, I was doing some work in, in a US Virgin Island, so a quite small island. It had a five megawatt solar plant. It's like 30 megawatt system, it's small. And they were having trouble with the, the frequency regulation because of the intermittent power from the solar plant because the clouds were passing over and the output was, was you know, moderating like that. And I said the answer to that is to build another five megawatt solar plant on the other side of the island. Because the clouds pass over this island quite slowly and this one was in the west side and if you put one in the east side, like together you add up the power and it almost firms it up in a way. So the more wind you have on, on your system in different places, the less you're going to have to worry about this variability. However, there are, um, there are ways to optimize your system to minimize your spinning reserves or your dynamic operating reserves, which you keep online to account for big ramps, like steep ramps of increased output from wind and decreased output from wind or solar. And to minimize it, forecasting really helps. So if you have some weather forecasting service and you can pr produce a forecast in very close to real time, like even a 10 minute ahead forecast of what your output is from your solar, your wind project, then it's, it's so much easier to deal with what you have on your system to account for that spin. 
So for example, in Texas, which has got you know, the, the highest wind installation of any state in the US, Texas, if you look at the increased wind capacity on the system, their operating reserves went down. There were two reasons that I just said. One is because they were installing more wind and just by nature of it being spread out, as weather systems move across the land, you have some uptake in wind and then some downtake and they sort of you know, moderate the output based on more wind. And two was that they got better at forecasting. And when they got better at forecasting, they were able to lower their requirement for operating reserves. So, you know, when you first get started in variable generation on your system, everyone is afraid of what it's going to do to reliability because you have to worry about frequency and you have to worry about voltage stability. But there's so many countries who have gone ahead of you who have increased their penetration and gotten comfortable with it on their system that there are many easy lessons to be learned. Thanks, Barb. Thanks, Barbara. So we are, I can't believe how fast the time flow, we are at the end of our session. But thank you very, very much for, was there one more question? Yes. Okay. What was the, what's the question? So the, the question, I think, if I understood it right, is how does wind power cost compare to nuclear power cost? Is that your question? So, well, so an, another loaded question. Well, one I'll have to first qualify. I'm, I'm not uh, a nuclear engineer or a nuclear developer, so I don't know what the cost is here to, to compare it. I know that in the United States, um, it's very difficult to, to get a project permitted and or built, and so those costs are, are um, not even worth talking about because you can't get the project, project built. So I don't know. I think in each country those costs can be different, so I'm not qualified to give you an estimate on nuclear power, um, but I, I am confident to say that once you get the first few built here, um, the wind resource, as you can see, this is at 120 meters, and, and, and towers are moving past 120, and people are talking about 160 meter towers. Now, I don't know, you're seeing those numbers, or these um, heights offshore. Um, I'm not sure at what year they'll show up onshore, but somewhere in between here is the right answer. <clears throat> And you've got wind speeds in the yellow here at seven meters per second. So you've got seven meter per second wind for, what's that, about 15, 20% of, of the land here. And that hunts. That's a very competitive uh, wind resource. Again, you have to understand what the installed cost is going to be, but I'm confident that you'll, you'll get, that, um, get that answered. In the U.S., um, in India and others, other areas where that, that transportation um, answer has been um, achieved, they've gotten very competitive prices and, and I would think that it, it could compete with, it should compete with all other technologies. But again, you want a diversified stack. So it's not one or the other, you want this diversified mix of, of generation types and that's usually the answer. I, so I can I speak to that probably a little bit. Okay. So 
uh, for levelized cost of energy, for, NREL produces a report called the Annual Technology Baseline Report. So it's available on our website, not just as a, like a hard copy PDF report, but also as a tool. So you can sort of put in different assumptions and come up with your own levelized costs of energies. Um, it is US based, so of course there'd be many modifications for Bangladesh. Um, but so that will give you like an LCOE for nuclear and LCO for wind. Except of course for wind, the biggest question is what's the capacity factor? Um, and also your cost of financing. And those are like the two biggest inputs for an LCOE calculation. There's also a company called Lazards that does the similar thing. So you can look that up, free information, Lazards to get that answer. Um, and uh, it's really not very hard to actually perform the calculation yourself and build the equation if you can customize the inputs to Bangladesh and most of that would be your cost of debt and your cost of equity here for those two plants. So it's a, a good analysis to do, um, to look at that LCOE. We, we do that for countries um, around the world as well. Thanks, Barbara. Again, thanks everyone for showing up and hopefully we answered some of your questions today.